If you just joined us, good afternoon and welcome to today's Coronavirus Town Hall. Uh, you are invited to participate by your state representative and we're pleased that you're with us today. I'm Brian Egolf, the Speaker of the New Mexico House of Representatives, and we're all here today to talk at length about coronavirus in New Mexico, answer your questions, and hear from you about your needs. We wish to hear from you, which is why we have experts on the call who can answer your questions and hopefully make this time a little easier for you and your loved ones. Taking your questions are the Secretary of Public Education, Dr. Ryan Stewart, Secretary of Workforce Solutions, Bill McCamley, and Secretary Kathy Kunkel from the New Mexico Department of Health. We greatly appreciate you joining us today and we want to hear from you. To ask a question of our speakers, please press zero on your keypad and you'll be connected directly with one of our operators. Again, press zero at any time to ask a question. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, by introducing the Secretary of the Department of Health, Kathy Kunkel. Uh, as, please remember, as you hear from uh, Secretary Kunkel, to push zero on your keypad if you'd, wish, if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, and with that, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you everyone for this opportunity. Um, I thought I would let you know that the, the main focus of the Department of Health right now is on testing. And so we have 60 test sites set up in 30 counties and these are available, the, what, the times they're available are on our website, which I will re refer to many times during this um, conversation. But I just want everyone to understand that we have these test sites every day that are open at different times and um, that are available for people who need to be tested. We also have emergent or urgent test sites that are set up daily based on the information that my division receives from ERD, the Epidemiology and Response. Uh, epidemiology and response division and they are the ones who are getting the test results overnight and then identifying places where we need to go and do specific testings on any given day for example lately that has been nursing homes and we are also um, going to pueblos that need our assistance urgently another big focus of the department of health is lab capacity so as we have expanded the criteria for testing we have put some pressure on our state laboratories who are processing those specimens. We continue to work to expand this capacity. We have a team dedicated to this. I do want to thank SLD and Tricor, the National Labs, Sandia and Lanel, and Gerald Champion Hospital, all of whom are attempting to stand up more testing for us so that we can continue to test um, as many people in the state as possible. NMSU is also working toward standing up testing, and we appreciate that very much. One of the challenges in our lab capacity is that there is a shortage of the supplies to run specific COVID tests. New Mexico is no different than any other state in that respect, and the governor works day and night to try to secure the uh, supplies that we need to run these complex tests. I was asked how we could stop the spread, and I know this is probably very, very common knowledge by now, but there is no vaccine, there is no antiviral, and the only way people can stop the spread of COVID virus is by social distancing. The Department of Health did make a recommendation on Friday that the general public begin to wear masks. We emphasize that this is in any way, does not in any way, replace social distancing, but it may provide some additional protection to individuals. And this change in direction came about because we now know that the virus can be spread by asymptomatic people, people who don't know they have it, and we know that it's easily transmitted through the air. What we do want to emphasize is that we are not suggesting people secure health care worker level masks. Homemade masks are what we are recommending people uh, try to find, and there is going to be guidance on our website today, if not the day to tomorrow, on CDC recommendations for making your own masks. And finally, who should be tested? There's a short, easy test on our website that uh, you can take that says, should I be tested? But we have expanded our testing, or our recommendations for testing, and always people who have fever, cough, or shortness of breath, always should be tested. In addition to that, though, we are now recommending that asymptomatic people who are close contacts 
or household members of a positive COVID case should be tested. We are recommending that asymptomatic residents in nursing homes or other congregate settings should be considered for testing. And we are recommending that asymptomatic healthcare workers and first responders who have concerns about their exposure should be tested. And I'm sure you have many questions, so I'll stand for questions. And please do refer to cv.nmhealth.org, where um, all of this information is there for your support. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. And we do have several questions for you and, and several questions for uh, Secretary McCamley. Uh, and we'll, uh, for those of you participating on the call, please uh, stay on the line, and we will get to your questions in uh, in four to six minutes. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Ryan Stewart, our Secretary of Public Education for New Mexico. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, be able to be on this call today. Really looking forward to your, your questions and thoughts. Um, just uh, as everybody knows, um, very recently the Public Education Department in collaboration with the Department of Health and with the Governor's Office did make the very difficult decision um, out, of, out of the need for safety for all of our students and staff members to um, close our school buildings for the rest of the year. Um, this was in response to what we've been seeing in terms of the spread of the virus and the fact that it's just not safe to bring um, large crowds of people back together in, into our school buildings as we're trying to do every proactive uh, measure that we can to stop the spread of the virus. As we've done this, I want to re I want to emphasize that even though our school buildings are closed, our schools are going to be providing learning options for all of our students. We've directed every school district and charter school in the state to submit to us a continuous learning plan and that plan may be technology-based or it may not be technology-based depending on the particular um, uh, structures that the, that the district has and the access or lack thereof to technology that our students have. But regardless, every district is going to be submitting a continuous learning plan which will outline the ways in which our teachers and our schools and our staff members will continue to provide learning experiences for all of our students um, through the rest of the school year. We've asked for those to come in on April 8th, and we expect that um, the schools and districts will start implementing those plans shortly after the 8th. We have actually already received about 35 of them so far, and we have a, a number of those 35 who have already started uh, with their continuous learning plans, whether it's through their online learning programs or whether it's through uh, distributing learning packets and learning kits and making uh, instructional opportunities available either through teleconference or other creative ways. So we encourage people to be in touch with their local school and their local district about the continuous learning plan and what it will look like. And we know it's going to look very different in every school and every district in the state. And the public education department is working very hard right now to make sure that we're supporting every school and every district to um, be able to pull those learning plans together, start implementing them, we're also working very closely in following the legislation coming out of the federal government to see how we can leverage emergency, emergency relief funds to be able to help close technology gaps and get more technology into the hands of, of students and, and, um, and also work on connectivity issues with our internet service providers where connectivity um, to the internet is a, is a problem for kids. So we're working really closely um, as that act has just been passed and the guidance is, um, we're still waiting for the full guidance to come out, but we will be actively monitoring that. And one thing I just want to say, it's really important now at this time, we're continuing to feed kids every day. So you can look on, on the newmexico.gov website in the education section. We have a, a list of all the different feeding sites around the state. Every district is still feeding students. Uh, we're also continuing to provide services for our students with special needs, um, either through remote or virtual sessions or other support services that can be provided at a, at a safe distance. And we also continue to know how important it is that we support our students uh, from a social and emotional aspect at this time. Um, we know that many of them are, are um, needing to know that their, their teachers are still with them, that their, that their other students are, are still with them, we're still standing strong beside them even though 
we have to do it at a social distance and um, especially for our high school seniors. And so we've asked our districts to uh, most importantly support our high school seniors. All of our seniors, no, no senior will be denied the ability to graduate because they had lack of access to the continuous learning plan. And we know that our districts and schools are still uh, looking to, to see when they can postpone, uh, but still hold proms and graduations and, and other seminal events for our high school seniors. So with that, I will pause and turn it back over to Speaker Eagle. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, and as we go to Secretary McCamley, uh, I want to remind people that we have uh, uh, a great number of terrific questions, and we'll get to those uh, right after uh, Secretary McCamley. Uh, Bill McCamley is the Secretary of the Department of Workforce Solutions that uh, is processing all of the applications for unemployment. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So as the speaker said, the Workforce Solutions Department is the state agency in New Mexico in charge of the unemployment program. As many of you probably know, uh, because of the public health orders, there are many people that work in restaurants, hotels, movie theaters, retail stores, uh, and so on that have lost their hours or temporarily lost their jobs uh, because of the situation. Um, just wanna let people know that during the Great Recession, our staff at the Workforce Solutions Department remember about 50 or 60,000 people being on the unemployment rolls uh, at its height, and it took about two years for New Mexico to kind of ramp up to that level because of the recession. It's looking like we will probably get to those numbers in about four or five weeks. Because of that, uh, we have had an extremely high volume of people applying for unemployment, many of whom have not done it before, and it's led to a lot of frustration amongst people as they can't get through on the phones and there's some um, misunderstandings of our website. We understand this is frustrating, uh, and trust me, we are working as hard as we possibly can to make systems simpler, answer people's questions, and put more people on the phones so that we can do a better job of getting uh, folks the resources they need. If you have to apply for unemployment, or if you know someone who has to apply for unemployment, we are highly, highly strongly encouraging you to use our website, which is jobs.state.nm.us. That is jobs.state.nm.us. Uh, the website has actually stayed very functional and pretty fast through this whole process, even with a high volume, which as compared to other states which have uh, had their websites crash, we're actually very proud of. Uh, the one thing I will say about the website, the, the biggest roadblock we've seen so far is with passwords. Uh, many people who have had unemployment accounts in the past can't remember their passwords. But the even bigger issue is that when people open up accounts, they don't follow the instructions and in entering the temporary password the correct way. And after three tries, the website will lock you out. So if you're going to get online, Please just be extra careful to follow the directions that are given in your email, and you should be able to log in and do okay. Um, if you do have to call our operations number, because of the high volume, we're really asking people to call on certain days associated with the last digit of your social security number. But the last digit of your social security number is zero to three. We're asking people to call on Monday, four to six to call on Tuesday, and seven to nine to call on Wednesday, leaving Thursday and Friday open for folks who either miss their day or can't get through. Uh, we have seen a reduction in call volume and we are getting more and more people on the phones every day. So we should be better this week at being able to get people on the phone. Um, the other question I was asked to talk about on this session was the implementation of the Federal CARES Act. So this was a bill that was passed a week ago in Congress it does a couple things regarding unemployment. The first is it allows for people on unemployment to get an extra $600 a week on top of their regular benefit uh, for I think 13 weeks. The second part of the CARES Act allows for self-employed folks to be able to get unemployment and people whose benefits have run out to get unemployment. Both of those are through a program called Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. Each of those things requires a couple things. It requires the federal government to give us guidance, as Secretary Stewart talked about before. Whenever a bill is passed, it's not like flipping a switch. You don't do it right away. 
You need the proper federal agency to set the rules for the specific parts of the bill to be in place before we can uh, start changing our system. We have received guidance as of last night around 9 p.m. on the $600 portion of the bill that I talked about. We have not received guidance on either the self-employed or the extension of benefits for people who have had theirs run out yet. Once we get guidance on those things, we then need to examine them and figure out how to change our own system to accommodate those and train our workers to be able to process uh, the new types of claims that can come in. The $600 addition uh, should be a little bit simpler. We'll be going over that first thing tomorrow to figure out what the details are and how we can start adding that to people's paychecks, but it still may be a little while before we get those in. And once again, we haven't received the rules yet for the self-employed folks and for people who've had their benefits run out. So as soon as we get those, uh, we will start looking at how to change our system so that we abide by their rules and get our folks trained up on that. That should still be a few weeks away yet. And I know uh, folks are, are worried and, and a lot of people are really looking forward to that, but we will let you know as soon as we are ready. The last thing I want to say, Mr. Speaker, is that we, we tell our folks this every day and we're asking the public to do the same three things. Number one, we hope everyone can stay patient. Uh, this is a new situation for everybody and we're all doing the best we can and working as hard as we know how to figure this out. But we're all trying to stay patient with each other. Number two is to stay kind. We're all one big family in the state. There's only about three degrees of three or six degrees of separation between pretty much everyone in the state. And, you know, our advice to our staff that we're asking the public to do the same is, can we treat everybody like we're on our best behavior at Thanksgiving dinner? And if we do that, it's going to be better. And the last thing is play team ball. We're all in this together. We all have a role to play. And if we keep our heads up and we do our role and we do it with patience and kindness, we're all going to get through this faster and get back to life uh, It should be faster. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to answering any questions folks have. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we're going to go straight to questions. Uh, we have Manuel Trujillo. Uh, he is now uh, – Mr. Trujillo, uh, you are on air. Would you like to ask your question, sir? Yes, it's uh, two questions. My wife works at a call center. And, uh, they're keeping 60 people to one room. Um, I'm kind of concerned about that because she – has diabetes, so that makes her more susceptible to it. And they told her if she decides to take a, try to take time off and take get unemployment, she'll lose her security clearance, and she'll have to reapply all over for her job. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that question, uh, Secretary uh, Kunkel. Would you uh, care yes. to uh, offer uh, a thought about the workplace? Very much. Thank you, Speaker. And. Uh, Mr. Trujillo, that's very concerning. I do know that um, we've had a considerable amount of conversation from the governor's office uh, on compliance with call centers. And um, I don't know which one you are referring to, but I do have some advice. And on there is my website or the Department of Health website that I refer to frequently. But there's another website called newmexico.gov. This N E W M E X I C O no spaces dot gov. This is the governor's website, and there's a button on it to report noncompliance of a non-essential business or stay-home instructions. Click here, so you can report this um, call center because that does not sound like the instruction that's in the public health order. And you can also contact me after this, and I will refer you to people who can um, carefully investigate the situation for you. So I recommend you do one or both of those things. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, Mr. Trujillo, uh, I, I would urge you to visit that website and uh, make a report so that we can get that uh, get that looked at. Okay, uh, we will now uh, go to uh, Linda Ortiz. Linda, I just lost you in the in the system here. Um, let me uh, go to Daniel Contreras uh, with a question about testing numbers by counties. Mr. Contreras, you are on the air. Please ask your question. Okay. 
Anyway, okay. uh, if you are you? able to hear me, uh, my, my question is... We can hear you. Um, okay, yes. Uh, yes. Um, are we able to get... Uh, is the New Mexico Department of Health able to post total numbers of tests taken uh, by county? Because uh, uh, we have total for the state, but we don't know how much they're distributed. And, uh, and even today, when, when the, the new numbers are posted, we just had the positives. Uh, there was, like, a total number of, of negative tests. Um, and then secondly, uh, are dogs, can dogs get the coronavirus? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Secretary Kunkel. Yes, thank you very much. Hello, uh, Mr. Contreras. So your first question first. The Department of Health does have testing numbers by counties. Uh, we have been working, believe it or not, hard. I don't know why it's so difficult, but we are going to have that up this week. It was questions that we want to make sure it's right, and I'm working with the governor's office so that we all release the same information. But, yes, we have it, and, yes, we will have it up this week. And to your second question, I am not a veterinarian, but my information is that, no, dogs cannot get the, corona, the coronavirus. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Contreras. Uh, we'll go now to Lisa, uh, I hope it's pronounced uh, Dooling, uh, with a question for Secretary uh, McCamley. Uh, Ms. Dooling, you are on the air. Hi. I hear your, your system is overloaded. I'm just wondering, what's the average length of time before you get your unemployment check, your first unemployment check, after you filed online? Sure, Lisa, and I thank you very much for the question. So the way the system works is that we have in New Mexico built in what is called a waiting week. We are actually looking to get rid of that, and that's one of the things we have to make systematic changes on, and we're looking to do that as soon as we can. But right now, if you, for instance, um, applied for unemployment last week, say Wednesday or Thursday, next week would be your waiting week, and the week after that, you would get your benefit. Now, there's two things to remember. Number one, once again, we really encourage people to apply online at jobs.state.nm.us. And if you do that, you can actually put your banking information into the system so that we can have a direct deposit so that it'll get there sooner uh, rather than what we have to do alternatively, which is send you a debit card. Secondly, we remind people you have to what is called certify every week. So the certification process is required by the federal government and it just is a series of questions showing that you haven't gotten another job. So if you don't certify, even during your waiting week, you're not going to be able to get there. Now, um, the one thing that may be holding people up is we have a process called adjudication. And during normal times, well, we would actually go through case by case and start looking to say, okay, uh, are there all the regulations being followed? Is everything okay with the employer, et cetera, and so on. We are actually changing our systems, and it started just last week to do what is called mass adjudication, where we're doing things in chunks uh, for the duration of this uh, pandemic. And so that shouldn't be an issue moving forward, and we do think most people should be getting their benefit checked on the schedule that I just outlined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, we have uh, six or seven questions, uh, Secretary Kunkel, about antibody uh, testing. Uh, does it exist, and when might it be available uh, for those who suspect that they uh, may have had uh, COVID-19 uh, and have recovered but did not test positive uh, for it during their illness? Thank you, Speaker. And this is a complicated question, and I am not a PhD in the biosciences. However, we do, we being the Department of Health and the teams that support me, do research um, every recommendation and referral we get on serological antibody testing. And it can be used for two reasons. One, as you've suggested, as a looking back to see if people um, have developed an immunity or if, and if they had it and we didn't know it, that's one purpose. It's also been used in some countries as a testing mechanism. But the problem with that is that you have to have had the active um, virus for up to seven days before it will test positive. And the tests that we have now, um, the, the RNA tests are effective. You know, they, the minute we test you, we know early on in the disease. So the 
the answer to the question is we do not have the um, we do we have not been able to access serological tests. We do try every time there is an opportunity to purchase them, even though there's a, some debate internally by really intelligent people about how we would use them. But we continue to try to secure them. It's just that all the states are fighting for the same resources. So to date, we have not been successful in securing them. However, we will continue to try. And going forward, they could be used in one of two ways. They could, if we are able to secure sufficient reagents for our current laboratory testing, then we would use it as a epidemiological tool to look back and see who had it. And it could be used potentially for healthcare workers to get them back to work sooner. But we don't have it yet, and there's a possibility that we might even need it in the future just for testing. So it's a little bit of a complicated answer, and I apologize, but we are looking at it every day, multiple scientists and doctors and people scouring the, um, the country and the world trying to purchase them. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, we have a question from Barbara Black. Uh, Barbara, you are on the air with a question for Secretary Stewart. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, one question that I have is I have children in my home at three separate grade levels. Uh, I have two in elementary school and one in high school. My concern is, is that the schedules that have been offered at this time for schooling, I'm getting classes that are needing to be done by each of the kids at the same time. Is there going to be some way that, uh, I don't know, an, an organized manner where we're not having to have three different devices in the home in order to get the education that is required for all three separate levels? Thank you, Ms. Black. That's a great question, and it's one of the um, really complex issues around some of the continuous learning plans and access to technology, because we know that for, for many families um, uh, who have multiple children, being able to do some of those things um, at the same time pre presents a, a, a major challenge. And so at the department, we are we're doing a couple of different things around this particular issue. One is um, we are looking into all um, funding efforts that we might have available in order to make sure that every individual student um, that we, for whom we can provide a device and support with connectivity, we, we can. Uh, similar to what Secretary McCamley said earlier, we are um, uh, still waiting on the, the federal guidance from the Department of Education on exactly how the emergency relief funds uh, will be distributed and can be starting can start to be used, so that we can start um, either directly or through our schools and districts um, being able to purchase and distribute additional devices, so that um, in cases like yours or in cases where a student doesn't have uh, where there are no devices in the home, that um, some of those challenges can be mitigated. In addition. Um, uh, the guidance that we're putting out to districts, um, this is one of the issues that we're helping our districts to work through. How do you make it accessible for families where, um, again, there are multiple children or um, or they're having to, uh, to to work around this in the same time period in the same ways? So we're encouraging schools and districts to offer asynchronous learning options where you don't actually have to physically be on the device at the same time. Uh, and in some cases, that, that also may be um, hard copy options where students um, don't have to be reliant on a device in order to access the learning. It's going to vary district by district and school by school. Um, and so maybe we can connect afterwards um, so I can learn a little bit more about which particular district and which particular school um, you're experiencing this with, and we can support that school or district individually. But uh, we're, we are trying to, to troubleshoot around some of those very issues. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And Ms. Black, we will get your uh, phone number, uh, and uh, we will uh, follow up after this call with you uh, so, to see if we can get you some specific help for your uh, exact uh, situation. 
Uh, next, uh, we will go to uh, Jeanette. I don't have a last name. Jeanette from Albuquerque uh, with another question for uh, Secretary Stewart about substitute teachers. Uh, Jeanette, you are on the air. Yes, this is Jeanette Salazar. I'm asking whether I uh, am entitled to unemployment benefits. I work as a substitute teacher in both the Albuquerque Public School District as well as the charter school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you, Ms. Salazar. And just as a quick clarifying question, uh, if you're able to respond, are, are you uh, in a long-term sub position where you've basically taken over the classroom for, say, somebody who's on maternity leave, or are you in the short-term role? Short-term. Thank you for the clarification. So with substitute teachers, the, the guidance that we've put out to, to school districts and charter schools is that if you have a long-term sub who would have been teaching in the classroom um, because they've taken over for a teacher um, and they would have been expected to be there if, if we had not closed, for those individuals, they should be part of your continuous learning plan and they should continue to be employed and paid um, as if the, the school were still in session because that teacher will be required to um, to continue delivering those services to, to the students during the continuous learning plan period. For short-term subs, it's a little bit different. Uh, we've encouraged districts where if there are ways in which short-term subs can help with things like um, connecting with students who need additional supports, um, if they can help with um, other classroom or instructional related activities during this time, then they can and should continue to be used in that way. But if there's not a clear, if there's not a clear um, way in which the, the short-term sub can be folded into the, the regular day-to-day -day continuous learning plan, um, in those cases then the uh, unemployment might apply. And I'll, I'll let Secretary McCamley chime in on the the eligibility requirements there. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank you, Secretary Stewart. So, uh, yes, Jeanette, if we have substitute teachers that use unemployment fairly regularly, uh, once again, if you are able to apply online at jobs.state.nm.us, we would encourage that. Furthermore, if you want to look at the specific eligibility requirements, I would encourage you uh, to visit our department website. That is dws.state. .nm.us. In order to be eligible for unemployment, you have to have worked in four out of the last five quarters, so uh, four out of the last five three-month periods, and you have to hit certain wage requirements. And you sound like with your uh, working at both schools, you might do that. But I would check dws.state.nm.us, and you can see uh, the different requirements for unemployment. We have a whole unemployment handbook that can show you all of those. Uh, thanks. And, and also, before we go to the next question, I'll mention for everyone on the call uh, that the main website, NewMexico.gov, has a COVID-19 uh, opening page with links to all of the websites that you're hearing about from Secretaries Kunkel, McCamley, and Stewart. Uh, so please visit NewMexico.gov. It's a great starting point to reach all of the other websites that you're hearing about. Uh, also, we're getting a number of questions. Uh, Secretary Kunkel, is the uh, is the link if you wish to report uh, a non-essential business that is operating or an essential business that is operating unsafely, uh, is that link accessible through NewMexico.gov? Yes, it is. Okay, so so members, so uh, participants can uh, you know, can visit there uh, for that uh, information. Uh, we now have a question from uh, Kevin uh, Chinyana. And Kevin, if you could tell us where you're Hi, calling yes. us from. Uh, you now have the, you, you're now on the air. Where are you calling us from? Yes, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Welcome. Yes, uh, I'm a ride share driver, and uh, I filled out the unemployment on your system. And I know that it's not set up for the self-employed unemployment yet. Um, I know that you're waiting on guidance for the situation. How long will it take to resolve this? 
um, when you get your systems up, and will you be offering back pay on that? Thanks for the question, Kevin. So the situation is this. Um, once we get our guidance from them, and I'll get a little nerdy here for a second and just tell you about the system so you know exactly what we're dealing with. The federal government-based pandemic unemployment assistance, which is the program that self-employed and contract workers like yourself can get in under, under uh, a program called disaster unemployment assistance, which states like Texas and Florida use fairly often because it's used for things like hurricanes and tornadoes and uh, things like that. We need to figure out, because the federal government needs to figure out how much different that uh, their new program will be. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, we need to know, number one, how much money people will get in. Traditionally, people in the disaster unemployment assistance program get less than people in regular unemployment. But the federal government may decide that the money amount is going to be the same. We don't know that yet. Another thing is what documentation you're going to need. So we imagine that the federal government will require some tax documentation showing that you're actually a contract uh, employee like you say you are. But we don't know what kind of documentation that's going to need to be yet. And we can't change our software so we can implement the system until we know that. What's going to happen is this. For folks like yourself um, who have applied and been denied or who will apply and be denied because they're contract workers, you'll then move into a separate lane. And that separate lane will be this pandemic unemployment assistance program. We need to make sure we get that site right so that when people go on to apply, it's not going to just fall apart um, as soon as all the, the contract workers get in and apply. We imagine it will be a few weeks. Uh, once again, we don't know how long that will take because we don't know what the rules are going to be, but it will at least be a couple more weeks at least once we get the rules, which we're hopefully going to get um, tomorrow or the next day, but once again, we don't know that. So please stay patient with us. We do believe that, it, that back pay will uh, be eligible from when we signed a contract with them, which was last weekend. But once again, we need to hear the specifics from the Department of Labor uh, on what that means. But we think that people should be able to get back pay from the beginning of last week, but we'll know more when we get those rules from them. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, now we are going to go to Pascualito Maestas from Taos uh, with a question. Uh, Mr. Counselor, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, my question is for Secretary Kunkel. Um, during the last um, presentation that the governor had on Friday, uh, we saw that Taos County has the highest per capita rate in the state. And we're starting to see some marketing efforts, um, re asking people from outside of the state to come and weather the storm, if you will, in Taos County. Um, now, it gets us a little worried, thinking that they might be bringing the virus unknowingly as, as they're asymptomatic into, the, into Taos County. So my question is about short-term rentals and if the state is considering any regulation around short-term rentals or how that 50% um, reduction in hotel rooms, if that applies somehow to short-term rentals. Um, hello, Mr. Messi. Thank you for that complicated question. Um, first of all, I'm not sure what you're referring in terms of the percent uh, percentage rate in Taos, but be that this will be available to you. As I said to an uh, earlier caller, we are going to be pr um, presenting county-level uh, data numbers tested soon. So, but but more concerning to me is is your statement that people are still traveling to Taos to ride this out, and I think you mean in so people are not supposed to be traveling from anywhere um, out of the state. We have people, Department of Health, at every airport, including in Taos, with a table trying to catch people who are flying in and telling them that they have to isolate for 14 days. So that's one thing we're doing. People are not supposed to be traveling from other states. Um, and I know we can't stop that. We cannot stop people at the border, but the governor is, does have people positioned at the border. We're watching this. So we are discouraging travel anywhere in the state, certainly to Taos. And I would be concerned if I were you as well. It was travelers who brought this to New Mexico. We knew that it would happen, and that is exactly how it did come. Um, but most of the 
spread we're having now is not from travelers, but there is just no reason to be traveling at this time. Short-term rentals, interesting. Um, that didn't come up when we issued the order on 50% uh, occupancy in hotels. Again, there is a button you can, it's the same one I was uh, um, helping the other caller with. If you report non-compliance of a non-essential business, you can press that button and say, do short-term rentals, should they be at 50%? Um, it, it would be, it's, it's sort of a, an interesting question. So if it were a huge hotel where we don't want people close to each other, that's, they want, we want them at 50. If short-term rentals are houses, um, that's, I think we would have to sort of sort that through, but there are people available in the governor's office to do just that. So I would encourage you to call or to, to um, contact the governor's office through that website. And again, um, I'm here. If, if that doesn't work, please call me through the um, office, through the Department of Health, and I'll make sure you get the answer. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, now we will go um, to Donald Marquez. Uh, with a question for Secretary McCamley. And if you tell us where you're calling from, sir, uh, welcome. The air is yours. Donald Marquez, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, we will go to Uh, Jane Fricano calling from Luna County with another question for the Secretary of Health. Ms. Fricano, uh, yes. you are on the air. Thank you. I am down in Luna County in Deming, and as uh, we do not get the answers to questions if there's any testing down here, if there are any cases or any of that on the news programs. And I'm glad to hear that there is a, a way we can do it. But also, I'm a blind person and I do not have access to a computer, especially since I've been hunkered down in my house for the last month or more. So is there any other way that we can get information rather than just through the computers? Thank you very much for that question. And that has come up. I'm sorry I didn't think of that sooner myself. But yes, everyone should call their local public health office. These individuals are on the front line every day, and they can look up whatever you need. If you look for, need a location, I don't want to volunteer them to do everything, but they will make sure you get what you need, whatever it takes. So do you, I mean, um, do you have the number of your local public health office? There are at least 53 of them in 33 counties, and we're keeping them open to do testing and also to answer questions and be of service to you like this. So again, I'm going to, I'll get that on the website. Well, it won't help you on the website, but you should call your Department of Health Public Health Office and ask for assistance, and I'll make sure that they are looking out for you as well. And Ms. Fricano, we will also get your contact information to uh, Representative Sweetser, uh, your state representative, so we can follow up uh, to see if there's something that we can do uh, to, be, uh, to be helpful. Speaker, if you could get uh, that to me, I'll make sure that we follow up. Very good. We, we'll do that too, uh, Madam Secretary. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Jenna Leah Milborn. Uh, if you please tell us where you're calling from, uh, that would be great. You are on the air, Ms. Milborn. Yes, I'm calling from Las Cruces, and my son works for a large orthodontic group that's uh, headquartered in Albuquerque. When they initially shut down, they were all told they'd be taking their vacation time. And after it was apparent that the state would be shut down longer than that, they were uh, they recommended that they file for unemployment, which he did. And he's been notified that he does not qualify because he didn't have any income in 2018, although he's worked for this practice for at least five years. And he files his taxes every year. And, you know, there would be a record of his employment with the state of New Mexico. I, I don't really understand why he was denied benefits. Thank you, Jenna Leah. This is Joe McCamley. I'm from Las Cruces, so it's nice to hear a neighbor. Um, 
I tell you what, if you could have him just email me his situation, I'll give you my personal email now. It's uh, B I L L period McCamley. So M C C A M L E Y at state dot n m dot u s. If you could have him email that information to me, we'll take a look. So usually uh, we require the employer uh, to help provide uh, some of the records for pay for the previous year. And there may just have been a mix up. We've had uh, about five or six times the amount of normal mail and faxes that we normally get. Obviously that was a huge increase in a couple of weeks and we're working very hard to process that, but there may have been some confusion there. So if you will have your son email me uh, with his situation and some contact information, we'll have one of our constituent services folks look into it. And once again, Thank you, my Mr. email is, is, can I just send my email for again in case you hadn't had a chance to write it Certainly, down? certainly, certainly. Yeah, it, it's my name, so B-I-L-L, period, M as in mother, C, C, A, M as in mother, L, E, Y, at state, S T A T E, dot N M, dot U S. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to Charles Green. Uh, Mr. Green, please tell us where you're calling from. And, sir, the air is yours. Hi, I'm from Albuquerque, and um, so I have two questions. One's a really quick one. Um, do we happen to know just when the stimulus is going to be sent out? I haven't heard anything from anywhere on it. And also, I've heard stuff from people like word of mouth, but I haven't seen anything online, but other people have. What's up with the rent and eviction thing if we don't have funds to pay rent right this moment? Thank you. Does uh, one of the secretaries uh, know the answer to the question about eviction? Uh, I, I can Paul? answer a part of it. I know that the Supreme Court of New Mexico has instructed all the courts in the state uh, not to take action on any petition filed in court uh, to evict uh, any person. Uh, so uh, if, if there's a threat of an eviction, uh, I, I do know that landlords are at this time not allowed uh, to, uh, they can file the case, but nothing will happen uh, in the case uh until the supreme court uh, uh lifts this restriction so so no court process can be used uh to reach an eviction uh and for uh, information about the federal stimulus uh the uh, website uh, sba that's sam bravo alpha dot gov sba dot gov has a tremendous amount of constantly updated information about uh, the federal uh stimulus uh program uh, next, and Mr. I'd like Speaker, to hear Charles. Oh, go ahead. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, just to add to that, I think that he may have also been asking about the $1,200 stimulus payments that the federal government has to go out. The IRS is actually the one, the department that is looking to get those payments out to folks, and they basically said it's going to be a few weeks. Um, once again, they're in the same situation as everyone else. Was there was a lot of uh, kind of pressure put on people in a very short amount of time. I know that it's going to be at least a few weeks, uh, but the reports that I've read say that, that they still don't have a due date for that yet, but it will be, you know, some time still. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We'd like to go to Charles Zoback. Uh, Mr. Zoback, uh, please tell us where you're calling from, and uh, the floor is yours, sir. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this. Uh, my questions are for uh, the Secretary of Health, uh, Kunkel, uh, Secretary Kunkel. I'm curious about the <clears throat> if there's any uh, testing and or any um, occurrences of the coronavirus at the uh, Veterans Home and Truth of Consequences. That's my first question. The second question has re regards to I saw a fabulous article about General um, um, Honoré, uh, Russell Honoré, who was the uh, FEMA guy during Katrina, and he suggested basically having some literally uh, military bean counters at any, any hospital that you could say 
Do you have 10 ventilators? That's great. Now, do you need one more or two more? So we have 20 hospitals on on the website in the, in the state of New Mexico. We need to have some control over that. We can't have uh, our state fighting with other states, with the U.S. government, with FEMA, as to who gets what, the PPE or mask or our equipment. So is that too much? I'll take my answer. Hello, Mr. Zoback, and thank you for asking me those questions. And I am responsible for the vet's home in Truth or Consequences, and I'm very, very grateful to say that, no, there is no COVID in any of my state facilities. We're no different than anyone else. We've just been very, very careful, and we restrict, um, we restrict visitation, and we test our staff as they come and go. But currently, we have no COVID at the vet's home. As to your second question, I'm not familiar with the FEMA guy, but I am um, painfully familiar with our struggle to get uh, sufficient resources for the state of New Mexico, and you can thank the governor for her incredible advocacy on our behalf. So there is a team. I, I don't disagree with you that it's, it's painful to be um, competing with our sister states, and we, we agree with you on that. It's very painful, and I wish we had a different national structure where that were not the case, but it is. Um, and so in order to protect New Mexicans, we have to do whatever we can to locate resources around the country. As for ventilators, there is a, a complex structure of um, crisis organization right now, and there is a team led by largely Dr. Um, David Sprays, who is the Secretary of Human Services, and they, and then there's a Department of Health um, component, and we count, we count every hospital bed every day. We count every ICU bed every day. We counted the ventilators, we counted the CPAPs, we count BiPAPs, we count every um, anesthesia machine that might be uh, renovated or used for ventilation. So there's a team that is um, looking at every opportunity, everything we have in the state to provide ventilation for New Mexicans. And no one enjoys uh, struggling uh, against our sister states looking for resources, but um, that's, that's just the situation we're in. As for ventilators, we're not going to get them. There is a stockpile. I don't know if you've seen that on the national news, but the, the stockpile just doesn't have enough, the national stockpile, to support the states that need it. So what we're trying to do is uh, find creative ways with certain equipment um, to, to renovate it, to use it as ventilators. We are exploring using the uh, one vent for two people, if necessary, and a lot of work goes into this every single day and Dr. Scraves uh, and his team should be commended for it. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, next, uh, we have a question from uh, Martin Neve. Uh, sir, uh, please uh, uh, ask your question and uh, let us know uh, where you're calling from. You're on the air. Yes, uh, thanks for taking the call. I'm calling from uh, Hidalgo County over here in Lordsburg, New Mexico. And uh, my concern is we do have a lot of interstate uh, traffic through here, and they do stop by at our local fast food uh, drive throughs I was wondering if Secretary Kunkel has, you know, in place or any kind of protocol as far as handling people's uh, credit debit cards as, they, as people go through our state. Uh, I know the, some of the workers at the drive through windows, they have their latex gloves and they just wear them for, to protect themselves all day long. However, to me, it seems like they're inadvertently possibly, you know, uh, passing on the, the virus germs uh, um, to, to even the local people because of the, because everything stays on their gloves. Also, as some of the larger retailers, we have everybody storming uh, like Walmart. And again, you have everybody in there, they're wearing their mask, but yet when you go to the to the keypad on the card reader, you slide your card, you sit there and punch the buttons. And I've seen people, uh, I, I mean, I myself, I, I do get one of the, take some uh, sanitizer with me and wipe my hands before and after. But in the fast food area, I'm hoping that something could be done so there's a procedure to protect the the people working there as well as the locals from people driving through. It's just I'd, something to, to slow the spread, you know. That, that's my concern and my question. Thank you, Thank Mr. Meehan. Uh, uh, Madam Secretary. 
Yes, thank you for that question. And you know, I'll be honest, I've had the, I don't get out much, but I've had the same thought about uh, fast food drive throughs So I don't know that the Department of Health has specific guidance for this on our website. Uh, we may be referring to CDC guidance, but I will take your question and your concern back to my team, to the, the, the epidemiologists and to the people who are, who do develop guidance. And I'll ask that we develop something like that. And thank you for calling my attention to it. Uh, just saying protect yourself all the time probably is not sufficient. So look for more to that from the Department of Health in the future. Thank you. And, and Madam Secretary, a, a little anecdote. Uh, I've noticed in the grocery stores that most places are able to uh, do a transaction based on a setting in their credit card machine so that you don't have to use the pen to sign your name or uh, to touch the keypad. Uh, and that might be something that could be encouraged uh, with businesses that are essential to remain open. Um, to look at. Uh, next, we have uh, Tracy uh, Duggan calling from La Mesa. Uh, Ms. Duggan, you are on the air. Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I was calling. I wanted to know what exactly, this is for Mr. Stewart, Secretary of Public Education. What exactly is the student and parent obligation in terms of distance learning and attendance for that learning? Thanks, Ms. Duggan. Um, appreciate the question. Uh, so at this time, each district and charter school is uh, finalizing their continuous learning plan. We expect all of those to be submitted to us by April 8th. And so your district uh, will be reaching out to you with the details of what that plan looks like and how they will take attendance and what their, um, what their particular uh, iteration of the plan will be. Uh, we put out guidance on how districts can construct these plans, both using technology and without using technology, but the details of it will differ uh, district by district. And so we'd encourage you to, to reach out to your local school or district um, on or after April 8th when that plan has been submitted. We're going through and approving those plans and then following up with schools and districts that need additional support to get those plans solidified and implemented as we speak. Um, and so the, the particulars of that will, will vary based on, on your particular circumstance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we've got about a dozen questions, uh, all asking the same, uh, uh, same question. It would be, uh, I think, for Secretary Kunkel. Uh, the question is whether or not COVID-19 uh, is airborne. Uh, can it travel uh, through the air uh, beyond the six-foot uh, distance that we are hearing about in the uh, guidelines uh, from uh, from your department. Thank you. Um, yes, COVID is airborne. Uh, the recent the recent information from uh, the COVID task force in Washington is that it passes in the air that people breathe. So six feet is clearly not going to be sufficient to protect you from that. It's, it's a very difficult situation. That's why the Department of Health and the CDC now are recommending wearing homemade masks because it will protect somewhat of this kind of airborne um, transmission. Thank you. Um, we have uh, next uh, a question uh, from Lisa Bloom from Taos. Uh, Lisa, you Hi. are here. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I'm an essential employee. I work in the market. I work in the bakery making tortillas. I don't meet criteria for testing, although I've tried to get tested. Will there be a point in time where uh, in essential employees can go get tested because the incubation period is so long? Ms. Lynn, this is Secretary Kunkel. Um, that's a concerning issue. We don't test, we generally weren't testing asymptomatic people, just asymptomatic generally, because it doesn't give us information and it doesn't protect you if you're truly negative. If, however, you are asymptomatic and you believe you've had a close contact with someone who is COVID positive, um, you are now eligible for testing. We still have to have some limits to testing because we want to catch people who are sick. We want to find people who are early in their disease. And we have to 
be careful with our resources, which even in our testing area are um, short, threatened, and we're constantly trying to find more resources. But um, I think we do prioritize uh, tests for asymptomatic individuals, as I said, healthcare workers, first responders, um, but they, uh, they think that they have been exposed, and so we prioritize them for testing. I do think that essential workers in the food industry, industry should also have that type of uh, consideration, so please call your local public health office, and they should be able to help you with this. We wouldn't want to do repeat testing on someone just because you are out in the public. However, I do recommend you mask and gloves and then talk to your public health office for advice. We are there to help you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, we have a bunch of questions about when do we expect to see the apex of cases uh, here in New Mexico? Uh, this is Secretary Kunkel. I'm going to assume that went to me. Uh, this, again, is managed by um, a group of, of really intelligent people in the medical advisory team. It includes um, Dr. Scraze from the Human Services Department and as well as many physicians from our private hospitals who have teamed up to try to use modeling techniques to make this decision and, and make these kind of predictions. Um, I think that we're looking at sometime mid-April, but I would prefer that I get you accurate information and uh, put that on the website from the team that is doing the modeling right now. So I'll follow up on that and I'll do that. Thank you. Uh, next we have Gina. I don't have a last name. Um, she says she's a small business owner with a question. Gina, would you please uh, let us know where you're calling from and you are on the air. Hi, I'm in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and I own a small uh, photo booth event rental company. Um, we've been around for about a decade, and it's we work primarily with independent contractors and just changed to an LLC status, but we file at it as an S-Corp. Uh, that being said, we don't have huge expenses, like we're not renting a facility, but we do use a portion of the house, which is uh, an entire studio with racks and everything. Anyways, uh, so utilities and rent and, of course, paying off equipment is something that's a, a monthly expense. I'm curious, I saw that there is something um, for grants or loans for small business owners. Is there anything that we would be able to qualify for um, during this time? Let me take okay. the first crack. Um, so we, uh, uh, Gina, um, I would urge you to go to uh, sba.gov in terms of what's available to your small business. Uh, the Governor Lujan Grisham, I was able to get in New Mexico one of the first allocations for disaster assistance loans from the SBA. Uh, information about that is on their website. They have a streamlined online application process. Uh, the second program from the SBA is called Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, a lot of information is available at the SBA's website as well. You can also get to it through NewMexico.gov, click on the Jobs in the Economy link, and you will be able to get a 1% interest loan from the SBA uh, that converts from a loan to a grant if you use the proceeds of the loan to pay rent, utilities, or payroll costs, which can be uh, regular wages to hourly workers, salaried workers, or to the owners of the business. Uh, there's a lot of good information at the, SBA, uh, the SBA's website, sba.gov, uh, and also at newmexico.gov. And you'll be able to get those Paycheck Protection uh, Program loans from any bank in New Mexico that is a, a, an SBA-approved lender. And there's a list of those at the website, sba.gov. And in the next, uh, hopefully, five to ten days, uh, any bank or credit union in New Mexico will be able to process uh, these Paycheck Protection loans. Uh, they're also available to independent contractors and uh, single-owner small businesses. Uh, so I would encourage you and anyone on the call who's, the, uh, who's an owner of a small business uh, to, uh, to check at sba.gov. Uh, Secretary McCanley, uh, would you like to add something? 
yeah, that, that's a wonderful answer. The only thing I would add is there may be some additional resources in New Mexico, and the Economic Development Department for New Mexico is offering uh, actually have a guide to what's going on with the CARES Act, which has some of the programs that Speaker talked about. You can access access them at the website G O N M. So go N M period B I Z. That is G O N M period B I Z. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, and for those on the call, we have time for two more questions. Uh, please remember uh, that at the end of the town hall, you'll be able to leave a voicemail uh, uh, on the line that we will get to your uh, state representative uh, for follow-up and answers to any questions that you might have uh, that we are uh, unable to, to get to. Uh, next, we'll go to Karen uh, from Albuquerque. I don't have a last name. Uh, she has a question about uh, corrections and incarcerated uh, persons in New Mexico. Karen, uh, please uh, ask your question. Uh, you're on the air. Hi, I would like to thank you guys for having this town hall meeting and um, actually including me in it. Um, my uh, question is for um, the Department of Health. Um, how are how is the Department of Health going to implement the precautions and and implement like like health health needs for people inside the prisons and jails because there's no social distancing in there. There's no way that can be implemented there because like some of those people live in uh, cubicles and and some of those people um, the the guards like uh, how are the guards how are they gonna like they're coming in from the outside to work in somewhere where there is not the the virus yet and and i say yet because we're like this is alarming because like that 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 like will be like a gas chamber in all reality and and like some of those people ain't doing a death sentence and and like because the medical there is terrible and like I, I, I'm like that's where the concern is at because there's no social distancing. The guards are not; they're wearing gloves, but they're not provided masks. Just like, uh, just like the governor asked for everybody that's an essential worker. This is an essential job that people have that they have to go so it operates. And they're not provided masks. And they're provided gloves, but they're not provided masks. They're, they're, they have contact with, with the, with the inmates. They have, they're passing okay, Karen, out their food. Karen, uh, Karen, yes. Karen, let me, let, let's go to the secretary to uh, uh, answer uh, what's happening uh, in the, in the jails. And uh, we'll have, enough, we'll have time then to, to get to another question. Uh, Madam Secretary, if you have Thank any information you. about you. what's happening uh, uh, with the uh, correctional facilities. Right, and this is a huge concern, and I can tell you three things that we're doing. So first, we, we broadened our testing um, criteria to include places like correctional facilities, and we were immediately in the MDC last week, and we swabbed everybody that was in contact with an individual there. We swabbed over 70 people in one, in, at, at one time. So we are increasing our testing at these facilities. And we do understand, I think everybody understands, that the very nature of correctional facilities is, prohibits the type of social distancing that the rest of us are able to achieve. So we do work with the Department of Corrections and every facility that wants to talk to us. They are on the phone with the De Department of Health, the Division of Epidemiology, the people who figure out what is the best way we can support people in congregate settings, which is what jails are. The third thing is that the courts are paroling certain individuals who are nonviolent, who um, had paroles coming up. I am not involved in the court action, but I know that it is happening soon. So we do share your concerns about this congregate setting as well as other congregate settings. And what we do is test more frequently, provide advice when we can, and do everything we can to get as many people out of the congregate setting as possible. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Jeffrey Watts 
uh, for our last uh, question. Uh, Mr. Watts, please uh, tell us where you are calling from, and you are on the air. I'm calling from North Albuquerque. Uh, my question involves the recent discussion of masks for all, in other words, uh, supplementing the uh, separation uh, by wearing, by requiring everyone to wearing wear a mask, particularly those that are homemade. Now, in looking up uh, all this on Google, I came up with an article which is summarized with commentary: masks for all for uh, COVID-19 is not based on sound data. Uh, that's a serious scientific article by Lisa Brusso, SCD, and Margaret uh, Setsima, PhD, in which they reviewed uh, all various kind of masks you could use. And in particular, uh, they discussed the uh, make-it-yourself mask, and, uh, and their conclusion about that was that uh, it is practically no of no use whatever it uh, uh and is way down the list from anything like the uh like the current mask being used uh, mr watts thank you for the question we're going to uh let secretary kunkel address the reason uh, that the guidance has been given for everyone to wear some form of face covering uh, when they are out in public. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you uh, take a moment just to remind people you know, why the governor has issued this directive? Yes, absolutely. We have learned recently that the virus can be spread by breath, that the virus can be spread by people who are asymptomatic. So while in the past we advised wearing masks if you were sick to keep others safe, we now think it's, it's uh, prudent for everyone to wear a face covering when they are out of the house, we do agree that it is, um, doesn't take any, is not as protective as social distancing, but we believe it provides some additional protection. And we cannot use the, um, the health grade masks, the N95s, because we need to reserve those for healthcare workers and first responders. Thank you. Uh, we are at the end of the calls. Uh, I'd like to give the opportunity to any of the uh, three secretaries to offer a, a final thought if they would like before we uh, conclude the call. I appreciate uh, that Secretary. because I do have, I actually have a correction or some additional information I would like to share re, uh, to the question, to the caller who asked about when we could expect the apex. Could I share that? Absolutely, please do. So from Dr. Scraze, who is the Secretary of Home, of, uh, Human Services, he writes that the surge, surge that fills the hospital capacity will be mid-April to early May. The peak date is not yet solidified as we need more data and a better response to self-isolation and social distancing from New Mexico, meaning if we are better at social distancing, we can push out the peak farther out, so it's difficult for us to predict. He also says that the surge date is above, and it is when the baseline capacity for hospital beds, ICU beds, or vents is full. The peak date is not really established because we don't know how well we'll do with social distancing, but when we have the most cases in one day, I think one day per week, um, that is when we will call it the peak. And I hope that that is a, a better answer than I gave previously. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Secretary McCamley, uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, we just really ask for patience in the unemployment situation. Um, this is not the perfect system for delivering help with this sort of thing, but nothing really is right now. And I just want to promise people that if they stay patient and kind, we are working as hard as we can to get help to everyone, and we will get help to you. We will find a way to make sure um, that folks get the benefits they need to get through this together, because at the end of the day, that's the important thing for people to stay home, flatten the curve, really not only help um, your neighbors and, and friends stay healthy, but also help our amazing workers in the hospitals who are on the front line against this thing. So we stay patient. We can stay kind. We work through this. Um, Governor Lujan Grisham has instructed all of us 
from the cabinet to fight like hell for as many dollars as we can from the federal government. Every single one of us is doing that. So just know that we are all busting our tails every day as hard as we can. And if we can all kind of stick together, we're going to get through this in the best possible way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Secretary Stewart. Any final Thank you. Um, one, one thing I would just, I would really appreciate if, if everybody who's on the call, those of you who have um, school aged children, those of you who have neighbors and friends and community members with school aged children, just to remind them that even though our school buildings are closed, uh, our learning processes will continue to happen. So our schools are ramping up right now. They'll be um, issuing their continuous learning plans and contacting students and families um, here in the next week. And so we just urge you to make sure people know about those, are, are in contact with their local schools and districts about them, and just know that the public education department is doing everything we can to help with the implementation of those plans. Thank you, sir. And uh, final thought from uh, the State House. Uh, I want everyone remaining on the call to know that uh, your state representative uh, and I are working with the secretaries on this call and with their staffs and with the governor's office every day with the singular goal in mind of keeping you and your families and your loved ones safe and healthy. These are unprecedented times. Uh, all of the work that these secretaries on the phone with us today are doing, uh, they are inventing new solutions to problems that we did not uh, know were going to exist uh, a few weeks ago, and they are doing an incredible job. They are working around the clock to provide economic assistance, uh, health support, and education support uh, to you and your communities, your small businesses every day. Uh, there's a huge amount of work left to be done, but I agree with Secretary McCamley that if we all stick together, we will get through this. Uh, it is a very, very trying time. Uh, if you need help uh, with resources for uh, your uh, mental health, uh, please visit NewMexico.gov, there are resources available there. Uh, and please stay in touch. Uh, at the end of this call, as I said, you'll have an opportunity to leave a voicemail for your state representative who will get back to you and answer the questions that you have uh, and to get you the resources uh, that you need. Uh, this, is, this is a very difficult time, but if we speak to one another, uh, if we have patience and kindness, and if we continue to communicate, uh, we will get problems solved, we will get needs addressed, and we will will absolutely uh, get through this. Uh, thank you very much for your participation this afternoon. Uh, again, uh, this was Brian Egolf, the Speaker of the House, with Secretaries Kunkel, McCamley, and Stewart, and your local state representative. Uh, we're glad we were able to answer so many of your questions, and please don't forget to leave a voicemail at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now -bye. at the end of this call so we can have uh, 
uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and 
uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Now at the end of this call so we can have uh, the follow-up that you need. Uh, God bless you all, and uh,